this were Windows, we'd have to take a break right now. <laughs> 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 uh, I spoke too early. <laughs> <laughs> surfing you know how hard could it be okay so the first thing he does if you're familiar with surfing around here is he takes me to cowls at high tide <laughs> and you would think okay so he's taking you to cowls at high tide but then he takes me down the stairs at high tide so let's just say that was a traumatic experience um, and the next time he takes me to pleasure point and he says yeah just go out there it's fine and, so I'm lucky to be here today. <laughs> um, I am here despite Doug's efforts to kill me. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm really happy. We uh, Let's just say that when I fall in love with stuff, I really go all in. And so uh, I took up paddle surfing in August in Santa Barbara at a summer camp. And I just loved it. And so... Uh, 90 days later, I bought a house in Santa Cruz because it's the most expensive sport I have ever taken. <laughs> you don't want to know how much paddleboarding costs. Um, and I have um, the world's greatest broker here, is Terry Mayall. And if you're buying or selling a property in Santa Cruz, uh, she is uh, the woman to go to, okay? And her husband, Will Mayall, is my best friend. So I have a very, very good friends. And um, they told me I have to live in East Cliff, not West Cliff. So um, <laughs> that's why I'm in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Those are the kooks, right? Um, so uh, just to finish off on paddle surfing. Um, so I live in Pleasure. Well, I have a house in Pleasure Point, and so I usually go to the Hook or 38th Street. So if you're a surfer and you see me on a board and I don't get out of your way or I take your way or all that, it's out of ignorance. I really don't understand <laughs> surfing etiquette. Yet. And if it's high tide and I'm trying to come in on 38th or the, the stairway on the other side of um, O'Neill's house and you see me about to get killed, please feel free to chip in. Because <laughs> uh, I have learned that the hard part of paddle surfing is getting out of the water. Uh, I almost died the other day, uh, but luckily, I don't know, there was pure luck that I'm still here. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the art of social media. Uh, this is one of my passions in life, and you heard a little bit about social media just now. I'm going to give you perhaps a, a more basic explanation and some of my theories and tips uh, for social media. Um, I'm very active on social media. <coughs> If you follow me, uh, in particular, if you want the purest form of guy on social media, it's Facebook. So it's facebook.com slash guy. Although I will tell you that between now and the end of the election, it's going to be one long commercial for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly, if you don't like that, tough shit. Because <laughs> I think Donald Trump is the new Hitler. And I am going to do everything I can to prevent his election. So um, that's now you want me to tell you how I really feel. Um, we can have someone who either doesn't know how to use email, or a misogynist, racist, person who makes fun of handicapped people, who is going to cause World War III. Those are the two choices. I take the email person any day. So um, that's how I really feel. And if you, you know, if you don't feel that way. Don't follow me. Uh, it is literally that simple. Um, so, uh, in the political, uh, just so you know, I'm with her. I want you to shoot me. We have a very odd situation where we have the most qualified, most vetted candidate going up 
against the least qualified, least vetted candidate. I just don't understand that, but that's okay. So, uh, end of political discourse. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about the art of social media. And after that, I'm gonna do a demo so I can show you how I actually make sausage. I'll take you behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, your heads might explode when, I, when you see what I do. Uh, it is a little scary. And uh, then we'll do a Q&A, okay? Okay, so. Um, the first thing I think you need to do to really perfect your social media is to perfect your perspective on social media. And the best metaphor, can I sit down because I feel a lot today. I, I went through, <laughs> I felt a lot and there's this thing I learned about the red tide. I didn't know about that before. I just thought water was always brown. Um, so. I'm hurting. So, uh, <laughs> and this was without Doug. So, uh, the first thing that I learned about social media is you have to perfect your baseline perspective about how social media works. And the best metaphor that I ever found for it is online dating. So, in online dating, there are two extremes. At one extreme, there is eHarmony. At eHarmony, the purpose is to find your soulmate. This is the man or woman that you're going to walk hand in hand, completing each other's sentences, strolling along the beach, right? Drinking white wine. Your home is perfectly clean. Your kids have 4.2 GPAs, 2,400 SATs. They're trying to choose between Dartmouth, Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. Okay, that's the purpose of eHarmony, to find your soulmate. And to find your soulmate, you have to kind of bear your soul. You have to talk about how outgoing you are, how, <laughs> how warm you are, and how quarrelsome you are, because this is soulmate. This is soulmates, oh my god. This is soul, I got, I'm afraid to touch the keyboard. This is soulmate searching, all right? At the other extreme, we have Tinder. <laughs> now, the way Tinder works is very different. So Tinder, you look at Scott's picture, and he's with a horse, and your daughter is into horses, so you think, I should probably date this guy, right? That, that's, you make that quick a decision. Um, or you could say, well, I really like unnatural shades of blonde, so yeah, I'll, I'll uh, contact Christine. Now one of these days, these people are gonna be in the audience I'm speaking to. <laughs> that's not something I'm looking forward to. Um, and then of course you could go and say, well, I like the Fabio look. So with Tinder, it's interesting, not interesting. It's a one second decision, right? I would make the case that social media is like Tinder. It's not eHarmony. People are gonna make an instant decision. Interesting, not interesting. Worth following, not worth following. It is that quick. So everything you do in social media, you should always be thinking Tinder, 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 Tinder. <laughs> not soulmate, 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 okay? Number two, you need to perfect your profile. And there are two components of a profile. Number one is your avatar, which is your picture. And this picture should convince people that you're likable, trustworthy, and competent. The word that's not on this list is interesting, okay? <laughs> that's not the purpose of an avatar. It is likable, trustworthy, and competent. And so I think it should be only your face, not your entire body, not you and your paddleboard, your tennis racket, your Mustang, your kids, your wife, your husband, nothing. It's just your face. Number two is that it should be asymmetric. You are not posing for a DUI arrest. Right? <laughs> it should be somewhat artistic. And third bullet point, make sure it's front lit. Duh, a picture should be front lit. You'd be amazed at how many pictures are not front lit. And the last thing is, I think your avatar should be the same everywhere. So that if you see Guy Kawasaki on Facebook, and you see Guy Kawasaki on Twitter, it's the same avatar, so you know it's the same Guy Kawasaki. Luckily, there are not too many Guy Kawasaki's, but if you have a name like Robin Smith, you'd be very good to know that Robin Smith on LinkedIn is the same as Twitter, is the same as Facebook, is the same as Google+, and Instagram and Pinterest, okay? So I think the avatar should be the same. So let's look at some avatars. So this person's avatar is not front-lit. <laughs> this is back-lit. Two problems with it. Not only is his avatar horrible, he has not changed the profile picture behind him. So this is a total unequivocal fail. 
right? Uh, another example. This person is trying to do too much with his avatar. He's trying to convince you that he's a family man with family values, right? Obviously, he's a Republican. <laughs> now, the thing he has done, unfortunately, is he's decapitated himself. <laughs> it's going to be very difficult to make a determination that he's likable, competent, and trustworthy if you don't see his head. That could be a problem. Uh, this is another person, so uh, this is Baba's avatar, and uh, he's using a dog. Not just any dog, a dog wearing a baseball cap. This is a total fail also. So these are bad avatars. I hope none of you have avatars that look like this. Now, we could also get into brands. So this is the BMW page. Now, BMW has a great recognizable logo and you see it in the upper left hand corner. The problem I have with this BMW avatar is that in the context that this avatar will be seen in many places, when it's a tiny little square, you can't tell what that is anymore. So if you look in the circle, it's very difficult to tell that that's the BMW logo. Uh, another German car is Porsche, also great logo, but in the context that you see it, it's very hard to tell that's a Porsche logo. On the other hand, being the Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador that I am, <laughs> this is Mercedes. Mercedes puts their logo front and center, takes up almost the whole avatar. No matter what context, how small you see it, you know that's the Mercedes brand. So if you are responsible for social media for a company, obviously the avatar should be the logo. But then consider how the logo looks. And the test here, is how it looks when it's small. I would draw an analogy to Amazon. So in Amazon, as an author, if you ever write a book, you're gonna be tempted to design this most awesome book cover. And you're gonna look at it one up, six inches by nine inches. And you're gonna see the delicate filigree font and these earth tones that blend into and match the Santa Cruz sunset. And you're gonna have these like very fine tiny little graphics because it's so beautiful. And you look at your six by nine cover and you think, my God, this is a work of art. People are gonna buy this book. Santa Cruz Bookshop will not be able to stock it fast enough. <laughs> but then in the real world, your book cover is about yay big. And it's next to 20 other covers in Amazon. And at Amazon, you can either read the title, yay big, or you cannot. Same thing is true with avatars, okay? That's what your avatar should be. The next thing is the cover photo. Now the purpose of the cover photo is to convince people that you're interested. Avatar is competent, likable, and trustworthy. Cover photo is that you're interested. Three key points. The cover photo should tell a story, a narrative. It should be optimized for the particular service because every service uses different dimensions. And finally, I think avatar should be towards the darker end of the spectrum. So, uh, excuse me, cover photos. So this is an old cover photo. So let me explain here. So obviously, face only, asymmetric. You look at that person, you say, my God, that is a, that is a likable, trustworthy cover. <laughs> How can you not conclude that, right? And then, what's the story I'm trying to tell with the cover photo? The story I'm trying to tell is that I am a funny guy. <laughs> People are laughing all around me. I am willing to get down on my knees. And I know Richard Branson and you don't. <laughs> I recently up, upgraded uh, everything. So this is my new avatar. And I'm trying to tell a story here. So I'm getting a little, you know, a little more complex. But it's still fundamentally my face. I'm looking at a iPhone, I'm, I'm still, I'm trying to convince you that I'm a friendly, competent, likable, trustworthy person. The picture on the side here is a picture of me talking in Las Vegas. That is a um, sporting center that holds 16,000 people. So I'm trying to tell the story that, you know, I'm fairly significant that 16,000 people would listen to my keynote speech. That's the story that I hope people intuit from my cover photo. That's what I'm trying to do. Oh, here's another example. So this guy is the double whammy. His avatar is a chimpanzee, and he's using a picture from a movie as his cover photo. 
Not clear to me. This is not Russell Crowe's Facebook account. Okay? <laughs> so not clear to me that he's convinced people that he's interesting, competent, or likable. Um, another example. Uh, Avatar is not bad, face only, but it is backlit. Um, probably, you know, most avatars when you see them, they're cropped out of a photo. You know, someone got lucky and took a photo, and the person says, oh, I look good in this photo, let's just crop everybody else out, right? You know, for, for what you want to accomplish with social media, my God, take a photo just for the purpose of an avatar. You know, how hard could that be? And then the picture there, uh, he's trying to tell a narrative. You know, he's a family man. He's got a poodle and a wife and two kids. Um, it'd be nice if they didn't look like zombies. You know? I think that would really improve the narrative. Uh, so how hard could that be? How hard could that be? Um, the next thing is a, a, a very strong feeling that I have that you should never, ever buy followers. There are lots of brands who buy followers. Uh, it becomes an arm race that, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a surfboard manufacturer and you see that Starboard has 3 million followers, then, you know, Surf Tech has to have 3 million followers, and then Isle, and then, you know, everybody has to. And meanwhile, you're basically buying followers who are, I don't know, you know, 16-year-old boys in Shanghai, and, you know, they have 5,000 accounts each. It's absolutely, absolutely the dumbest thing to do. It is dishonest. It is unethical and it is stupid. Besides that, there's nothing wrong with buying followers. So I show you a picture. So you know, yes, you too can have 10,000 followers for 249.95. So you know, just Google buy Instagram followers. You'll see ads like this all day long. Never ever do this. This is intellectually dishonest, and it is a total waste of money. Okay. Next thing is you should never abdicate to interns and agencies. If you're running social media for a company, don't just say, well, this person has a Facebook account, so let's just put her in charge of social media. How hard could that be? Or at the other extreme, you say, well, uh, this agency has proven advertising and PR. Why don't we pay them $20,000 a month to make four tweets? You know, it's only 5,000 a tweet. So I, I hope that whenever you meet with your social media team or you meet with the people who are doing your marketing and PR, it does not look like this. Okay, this is like the perfect, perfect, absolute stock photo, right? So we got like three women, you know, four women actually. So four to three, got the right ratio there. We have, you know, two black people. We got all the good stuff here, right? So this is like what interns look like. Um, when they're not playing volleyball, or eating the free food, or getting the free massage, this is not what your social media team should look like. Okay, Social media, I think today, equals marketing. It's not a, a form of marketing, it is not a subset of marketing, it is marketing. And because it is marketing, you can't just abdicate to any person who happens to have a Facebook account. And you certainly should, and should not give it to agencies. I think that agencies are gonna rip you off. Hope there's no agencies here. Um, number five. Number five is very, very fundamental, which is, you know, I meet with people all the time and they say, well, we got this SEO expert and this person has figured out that if you put these keywords in the H5, you know, level heading, that, you know, that's what Matt cuts in Google, that's what they're looking for, so we figured out how to game Google, right? Now, my theory on this and content is basically Google is in the business of finding good shit. So all you have to do is post good shit and then Google will find it. Very simple. That's what you should do. And you know this concept that you're going to outsmart Google. So Google has like 25,000 computer science PhDs, right? And you are going to outsmart them by sticking the right word in your H5 level header. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That, that's what Larry and Sergey never thought that you're going to stuff keywords in your thing. So just post good shit, really. Post, just tweet that right now. Guy says, post good shit. That's, that's all the SEO you need to know, okay? A corollary of this is what I call the NPR model. And the NPR model is that you post good shit all the time. And when you post good shit all the time, then you earn the right to run a pledge drive. 
Okay? You know, why do we put up with the NPR pledge drive? Why do we donate money to NPR? It's because we feel a sense of moral obligation. They provide such great content. So I want you to think like NPR. When you post, post stuff that helps your followers. Not necessarily helps you. So 80 or 90% of the time, try to post stuff that helps them. If you're a travel agency, you know, and you find a story about the 50 best uh, food trucks in Austin, post that. If you find an article in CNN, um, this is how to figure out whether you need Global Entry, or whether you need Nexus, or whether you need the e-passport. You know, this is what each one is for. This is why you need Global Entry. This is why you need Nexus for Canada. This is why you need the e-passport. So you're, you're, you're an airline, you're a hotel, you're helping people travel better. And then every once in a while, hit them with your promotion, your pledge drive. Your pledge drive is, we have a special weekend price, right? We open up a new route that goes from San Jose to Las Vegas. And while you're in Las Vegas, these are the 10 best, you know, barbecue places in Las Vegas. It's all about that. It's about providing value. So uh, the only two organizations that really pull this off are NPR and um, Wikipedia. I'm on the board of trustees of Wikipedia, so I can tell you with total certainty that we raise $80 million. And it's because people feel a sense of moral obligation and reciprocation to Wikipedia. Every once in a while, you see a banner that says, help out Wikipedia, and lots of people click on that, okay? So you think of yourself as NPR or Wikipedia, then you run your promotion. Nobody likes the pledge drive. You have to earn the right to run the pledge drive. I don't think anybody anywhere sitting around thinking, oh, if only I could get that Eton hand crank radio. <laughs> <laughs> because right now, you know, Starbucks is doing a dollar for dollar match and I could get that $10 Eat crank, Eton hand crank radio so that in case of a nuclear attack, I will find out how I'm going to die. Uh, I might make the case that if Donald Trump becomes president, you better get that. <laughs> That's okay. I will be on 38th Street. Uh, Avenue, Avenue, okay? So this is kind of the rough mix that I try to do. Uh, most of my effort is curation. Uh, I also reshare posts. So as opposed to, curation means I point to the source, the very source. Reshare means I take CNNs and I reshare it, or I take National Geographics and I reshare it. Their post actually, it goes to the source. 5% um, of the time I create stuff, and 5% of the time I, cr I promote Canva, I promote uh, my books, I promote me, Guy Kawasaki, the brand. But it's roughly one out of 20 times. Um, you know, imagine if NPR ran the pledge drive 365 days a year, right? I mean, not even NPR could get away with that. Uh, number six, number six is to add a picture or video to every single post, literally every single post. So uh, this is an example of a fast company tweet. And I think that most people in the world think that people see a tweet like this, one up. But in the real world, people see a tweet like this, five or six up. So this is the same tweet in the context that most people will see it. And this is about a six-way tie for second. Like, none of those tweets particularly jump out at you, right? So what I'm suggesting is for every tweet you make, for every post you make, you put in a picture. So this is a Mercedes-Benz tweet, and they put in a picture. Guess which one gets the most attention? It's the one with the picture. Put in a picture. Now speaking of pictures, I just want to evangelize a concept here that you should never shoot vertical. <laughs> I hate vertical. The only time you should be holding your phone vertically is if you're shooting for Instagram and it's square. But most people, when they hold it vertical, they're shooting vertical. So this is an example. So this is a father and his three sons at the Maker Fair. You would think of all cases, this is the time to shoot vertical, right? Tall people standing in front of tall Maker Fair doughboy, right? Okay. I would make the case that this is a stronger shot. 
you still see the family and you still see this big balloon behind them. And I would further make the case that you can never crop too much. So this is the best photo of all. You don't have to see the waist to the feet of most people. It's ugly for most people. <laughs> Honestly, you just don't need to see that, right? And you still can intuit that, wow, this is kind of an interesting place. They, they're standing in front of this big red balloon at the Maker Faire. This is a stronger photo. Um, I would also make the case by cropping and shooting horizontal, you can see much more of the facial expressions. And then you can intuit what's going on here. So the way I look at this photo, I say, ah, so this father took his three boys to Maker Faire, right? Spending quality time with his boys. His wife is saying, hella freaking hallelujah. For the first time in 20 years, I'm alone in the house, right? All those animals are gone. I hope Maker Fair is like a week long. <laughs> first, I'm going to go yoga, and then I'm going to go to uh, Verge, and then a ver is it Verge or Fur? Fur, yeah, whatever. All right. What's the new place? What's the cat and claw? Cat and claw. What is it? Cat and claw. Cat and claw. Okay, cat and claw. Although, you know, I, I, I don't want to like shake you up too much. I know I should be at Verb, and I know I should be at Cat and Cloud, but I'm across the street at that donuts place. That <laughs> place is great, donuts. I love those donuts. It's like, that's step one for paddle surfing. Okay. So anyway, shoot horizontal and crop. Uh, number seven is my recommendation that you focus your social media on Facebook, really. Um, just from, from my experience, Facebook is the most powerful platform. It gets the most interaction, it gets the most um, shares, the most comments, the most everything. And I also, I just love the fact that you can target so specifically that, you know, Terry could say, all right, so I want people who are living in the Bay Area, uh, who are such and such an age, female, and living in this zip code to show them a Santa Cruz property. Right? I don't know how you can do that any place else, self-serve, so I love Facebook. Um, uh, this is uh, some tips about Facebook. So number one on Facebook is, uh, on the left you see a video that I uploaded directly to Facebook. On the right you see, I, I see an embedded Facebook, excuse me, an embedded YouTube video. And what I'm trying to show you here, same video posted almost at the same time. The one on the left was seen by 30,000 people. The one on the right was seen by 13,000 people. Same video, okay? And what I learned from this is that Facebook wants you to upload natively. So if you have video, you upload once to YouTube and once to Facebook. Don't just upload to YouTube and then grab the embed code and put it in Facebook because you're gonna get one third of the action that you should. And if you think about it, this makes perfect sense because if you were Mark Zuckerberg and you had a video property, right? what are you gonna promote more, your own video or Google's YouTube video? Duh, of course you're gonna show your video more. So it's bigger, it's automatically playing, it's not that little thing and you have to press the arrow and hope for the best. Okay, so upload natively. Um, the other thing is even better than uploading vid uh, natively is to go live. Um, just do live video. Now you might say, well, what you know, what should I do live video? So we're we're going live right now, and um, it's any kind of lecture. It's you know, if you're a restaurant, show the behind the scenes. If you are, you know, show that you're shopping at the street fair. I mean, show, show how things are made. If you, you know, if you're United Airlines, show the maintenance facility, how that works at SFO. Uh, I would love to see how surfboards are shaped. You know, it's like go behind the scenes, show people. Every business has something that's interesting. Show tips. If you, if you are. Let's say you are a restaurant and you want to say, well, you know, this is the best way to preserve an open bottle of wine. Okay? Um, now, this is an extreme example. So one day I was in my office and I, my pug was asleep and my pug started snoring. So I turned on Facebook Live and like 16,000 people watched that pug sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> to my utter amazement. 
and, and so I, you know, this is before I fell in love with Santa Cruz. I put a little, oh, a little, what is the deal here? I put a little um, plug for Bondi Beach. Have you ever been to Bondi? Yeah. yeah. It's like Pleasure Point without rocks. So uh, anyway, so everybody has something you can do live. I promise you, everybody has something. When there's a big storm, Facebook Live. Just show the waves, whatever it is. Um, this is an example from Mercedes. Uh, Mercedes did a Facebook Live from the, um, I think it was the Paris Auto Show. And they just showed this person driving around the New Year's E-Series and they got 287,000 views. It costs nothing to do, okay? Go live on Facebook. Number eight. Number eight is that you should always foster user-generated content. Show your customers eating your food. Show people's watch bands. Uh, show, show people with your t-shirts, whatever it is. Let people show themselves with their cars. Um, Canva sponsored a contest where people created ads about travel. Um, you, you're always trying to foster user-generated content because I think what happens with user-generated content is as soon as someone posts their picture, they tell all their friends, go look at my picture, and that increases brand awareness for you. That's what it's all about. So foster user-generated content. Number nine, number nine is to repeat your posts. Uh, many people believe you should not repeat your posts. Uh, I think that is delusional. They're, they're thinking that you know, your post is so significant that people are going to scroll back through 100,000 tweets to find the one you made eight hours ago. That is just not going to happen. Um, as an experiment, you know, someday when you have nothing better to do, I suggest after November 8th, go watch CNN for a few hours. And you'll see that CNN repeats the same freaking story. I mean, not an update to the story. It's the same story. Watch ESPN. You're going to see replays from the World Series for the next... You know, 36 hours, the same replay. Uh, even at a high brow level, um, fresh air, fresh air goes two or three times. They go at like, you know, 10 in the morning, 2 a.m. I mean, it, and it's not because these people are stupid, it's because people consume media at different times of day. Even if all your followers were in the Pacific time zone, some people check it in the morning, some people check it when they get to the office, some people check it at lunch, some people check it in the afternoon, some people check it after the kids are asleep. All living in California, they're all up and they're all going to sleep at about the same time, but they consume in different ways. So this is an example, a stunning example, even for me. So I uh, mistakenly posted the same thing on Facebook three times, 10.30 uh, a.m., 6.30 p.m., and 2.30 a.m. And that's the reach that it had. <laughs> Most people would tell you, oh, you should post business hours specific. And I would have gotten a reach of 20,000. But I happened to also post it at 6.30 p.m., and now I got 40,000. And then I don't know why, but at 2.30 a.m., 160,000 people were reached. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to happen every time for you, but it's worth an experiment. Okay, so the, the way you do something like this, and I'll show you Twitter. So this is Twitter, three tweets identical, um, and you see the amount of clicks to the link in the tweet. So first hump, second hump, third hump, right? It's a set. So the, the very interesting thing is uh, the way I do these experiments is I go to Bitly and I get a Bitly link that points to the source. And then with Bitly, you can see when people clicked on the link. So this is basically a Bitly graph. So I can tell when people clicked on my Bitly link. And I'm telling you with total certainty that posting eight hours apart, you'll get three times the reach that you get for posting once, at least for me. So maybe it's just me, but I suggest you try. Now, if you do this, you will get some people who will complain. They'll say, you tweet too much, you post too much, you're a spammer. And I get about five of those a day. I have a million and a half followers on Twitter, so I figure it'll take 300,000 days to piss everybody off. <laughs> By then, it won't matter, so I don't care. So I would say that, you know, I'm pissing five people off, so maybe, you know, you use the rule of thumb that if five people complain, really, it's ten times that. So I piss off 50 people a day. So I piss off 50 people a day, but 
I now get you know, 10,000 shares, I get, I'm not shares, 10,000 looks, 10,000 reach. So at some point, it's just numbers, right? So you, you make the calculation, you may piss people off, but you're gonna reach so many more people, three X more, it's worth it. And that's the calculation that I make. I will also tell you that philosophically, when people complain, they say, you know, you tweet too much. I saw the same tweet three times. My response is, that says more about your lack of a life than it says about me. <laughs> How the hell is it that you saw my tweet three times in 24 hours? That's like saying, oh, I turned my TV on to QVC and I saw the same tourmaline bracelet sold 24, in 24 hours three times. You know, you, you, you're like running that tourmaline bracelet sale too much. What the hell are you doing watching QVC for 24 hours? That's my question. So don't blame me that you don't have a life. <laughs> So I'm telling you, repeat your posts, repeat your posts, okay? Um, number 10 is, is after you got all this great content, <laughs> what? Which one of those 10 videos? <laughs> no, this is, okay, this is, I'll tell you why this is Apple's fault. <laughs> this is good. Tweet this too. So, this is a 2013 MacBook Pro. Okay, so I've had, a, I've had the same computer for three years. It used to be that I changed every year because every year something significant would happen. But for three years, nothing significant happened. So I've had the same computer for three years using these same stinking, you know, ports. And so now the ports are loose. And so that's what's happening. So if Apple would revise their computers faster, this would not happen. So, <laughs> I mean, it's Apple's fault, really. It is Apple's fault. So, where was I? So, uh, perfect your shareability. So, once you know you have this great content, you have this great website, you're doing well on social media, then just do this little test. So, this little test is you grab. How many of you use Chrome? Okay. Wow. So, you use Chrome and go to Chrome and get an extension called Pinit, P-I-N-I-T. So the purpose of Pinit is that when you are on a page that you want to pin to Pinterest, you just click on the little extension thing icon and then it will create a draft Pinterest post. And the reason why you do this is because you want to see what Pinterest is guessing is the picture you want to post. <laughs> So, here's a case study. So I was at the online photographer, this is a story about the 130th anniversary of Zeiss, okay? So guess which picture I want to post? It's the guy, Mr. Zeiss, with his lens. Okay, so I'm in Chrome, I, pick, I, I click on pin it, and the first time I get the sidebar ad. I click again. Get another sidebar ad. I click again. I get another sidebar ad. But I'm an OCD Asian. I keep clicking. Okay? So now I get the RSS feed. Okay? The fifth click, I get that. How stupid can you be? Right? Like, this is what I'm supposed to get on the first click. The first click. So I want you as a little experiment to go and try something like this and see, you know, for your blog post, for your website, what graphic does Pinterest grab? Because God forbid you have this great content and people want to share it and they click on a pin it button or they copy your link and they paste it into Facebook and it grabs the sidebar ads or the RSS feed icon. Oh my God, how stupid can you be? So this is perfecting your shareability, okay? And the next thing I'm gonna tell you is that how many of you use Canva already? Okay, oh my God, we're gonna have to fix that. So, you know, we need to do two, three, three things in, in Santa Cruz to make it perfect. First, we gotta get everybody using Canva. Second, we need an Apple store. Yeah. Right? And third, we need a bike path that goes from yeah. the east side to the west side. Because my 
my fantasy is not to die on Cliff Drive. I would like a straight shot from the east side to the west side. Seems to me you should just go where the train needs to go. But hey, what do I know? But anyway, okay. I know, you know, for the people who like Trump and trains, I just blew it, but what can I say? So, Canva is an online graphics design service, and it helps you create beautiful graphics. Where's Bud Colligan? Bud, uh, did I do you proud, Bud? Where's Bud? He left. You did a good job, but you didn't mention Measure D. <laughs> so, Canva is an online graphic design service, and we help you create all these optimized graphics. We have templates for every possible use of graphics. And if you go to canva.com slash gif slash guy live, you'll get a $10 coupon. You may never need this 10 bucks because you could use your own photos, or you could use our free designs, but you may. And so this is, I want you to all try Canva. Okay, this is, this is, you know what I told you about NPR and Wikipedia that I provide, that they provide great content, and then so you feel like this moral obligation to reciprocate. This is it, baby. Now is the time to reciprocate. I gave you great tips about social media. I'm asking for, in return, you just try Canva. Is that too much to ask? Not at all, you're right. So, try Canva. Now, I am going to show you in real time how I make sausage, okay? Going to be scared. Okay, so wait, you're off. Did it just get soft? Did I shut it off? Yep. How did I do that? Okay. So um, this is my Facebook account. And I tend to focus on Facebook. So if you want to see the purest, most manual, truly guy's interests, uh, go to facebook.com slash guy, G-U-Y, okay? So what I do is I'm thinking like NPR and I'm thinking like Wikipedia. I want to provide great content all the time. So I, I need to find great content literally every day, every day. So I use several things. So one is Alltop. So Alltop is a website that uh, Will and I, we co-founded a company. And uh, what I do is I go, Alltop stands for all the topics. So it's aggregating RSS feeds by topic, okay? So uh, I, in particular, I love politics right now, so I go to politics.alltop.com. And I'm looking at the mobile version because um, I, I hardwire myself to the mobile version. The desktop version is prettier than this, but I like to see as much as I can with as little white space as possible because I'm trying to look through headlines as fast as possible. Okay, so I look through this. And I see something interesting like, uh, Trump's latest gambit, early voting buyer's remorse. So that's a story that I would like to highlight. So I click on it, and I actually go to the story, <laughs> and it's 404 not found. Jeez. Blue screen, blue screen. Yeah. No, blue screen. You're lucky. So you didn't know it was not found. <laughs> It is loose. I'm telling you, it's Tim Cook's fault. <laughs> okay, okay, so I'm at all top. I'm looking for an interesting thing. Oh, British town will burn 36 foot Trump, Donald Trump statue. I like that. So, <laughs> this town is rigged. Okay, so, you know, I look at something like that. Oh, they shot vertically um, <laughs> and I say okay so this is an interesting story then I use a product called social champ and what social champ is is kind of like buffer or Hootsuite or sprout are you familiar with those three things they help you post well I like social champ I think it has a clean user, user interface and so I click on that and then this takes in the headline and it puts in the link and I'm going to post it to uh, Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus. And I don't know why the Facebook um, avatar is not coming in right now. So this is kind of a draft, okay? And I can change this text, but let's just leave it the way it is. And then I have three choices. I can stick it in a queue. So with Social Champ, I made it so that at 6, 8, 10, 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, you post. So if I click on queue, then it goes into that queue. <laughs> 
If I click on schedule, it allows me to schedule it for a specific day and time. And if I click on post, it posts immediately, right? So I want to post this immediately. So I click on accept. And just now I post it to Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. So that's, that's what I do all day long. I look for stuff like that. Now, I don't just use my laptop for this. Um, I, I am constantly on my phone. And on my phone, I use uh, Apple, uh, Apple News. I use Smart News. I use Google News. And so I'm on my phone or I'm on my iPad and I find interesting stuff, often late at night when I cannot sleep. So I just need to kind of put a little reminder to myself to post this later when I'm coaching. Okay? So I'm on my iPhone and then I'll open a reminder. So this is my reminders. And so with reminders, these are the stories that I have found that I want to post later when I'm up. Okay? So I might have found these at 3 a.m. So economists denounce Trump in open letter. So I found that. Now if now pretend it's you know eight hours later and I'm actually awake and I say, okay, now I really want to post this. So then I, I click on it. Um, notice this share orange button. This is social champ saying you can pick this particular picture in the post to use as the picture. So if there's multiple pictures. I can choose this one instead, right? So this is giving me the ability to choose exactly which picture is used for the post. And then I click on share and it gets the same three choices. Do I stick it in the queue, schedule it for a specific time, or post right now? So uh, that's, I'll stick it in the queue. Oh my God. <laughs> I'll stick it in the queue, so that'll come out later. Okay, so this is how I find stuff. Now, a little power tip for you. So this is my reminders file. So these are all the stories that I have selected to post later. Reminders is syncing over iCloud with a virtual assistant. The virtual assistant also looks at this particular reminders list and says, okay, this is what guy wants to post. So I will post and then she would mark it you know, done. So now it's gone. It's posted. So this is a way of me sticking stuff into a queue and then multiple people can actually do the final act of posting. And we need to not step on each other's toes and duplicate posts. So we sync over iCloud with reminders. As soon as she posts it, she marks it done. It disappears from my queue. Okay. So that's, that's basically um, how I make the sausage. Now going into greater depth about making sausage, so now, let's just say when you are blatantly honest about how you feel about stuff, you tend to attract trolls. Or I call them trignoramuses, which is a conjunction of troll and ignoramus. <laughs> so um, I used to have a, a very different attitude with trolls. I would have kind of a zero tolerance. I would just uh, delete their posts and block them. But then I figured out an even better way. And the even better way is instead of deleting and blocking, I now hide their posts. And on Facebook, the advantage of hiding a comment is that the person who made the comment still sees it. And the troll's troll friends also see it. Okay? So this is a beautiful thing. So Bubba attacks me, okay? Baba comes back, still sees his comment, oh, guy did it, delete it. And then Baba's friends see it, and they interact. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a lot of interaction because I'm trying to troll the trolls. <laughs> so the way this works is I leave, I, I leave all this stuff and, and I hide it. And then it creates more interaction. So then Facebook says, ah, must be interesting posts. Put it in more people's timelines. So then, sometimes when I really want to just fry, well, I should have done that. Sometimes when I really want to fry their brains, I actually tell them that you know it's you're very good for my reach and engagement. So keep attacking me because you're helping Hillary every time. You attack me. That just makes their heads explode. And so, so I'll show you how you do this. I don't know if you realize this. 
But, okay, so, see, that's the one I just posted, the one I just found. Oh, look at it. I promise you, I have a new back MacBook on order. <laughs> of course, the dongle's not shipping yet. But that's okay. okay, so that's the one that I just posted. So, uh, let's see, have I gotten any hate mail yet? Um, let's see. So uh, this is a story about two-headed sharks. Uh, let's, I gotta find one where there's lots of hateful stuff. That shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> okay, so, um, here's one where the Ku Klux Klan official newspaper, um, endorsed Donald Trump. That's not gonna be too controversial. So, there's like eight comments here, and, um, you know, so this is, this is, the nature of my kind of comments, you know, Hillary Clinton was a member of the KKK, do drug dealers spend money at Walmart, does this mean that Walmart supports the drug trade, I don't know what the hell these guys are talking about. <laughs> um, I'm no Trump fan, but this one is not as clear as people want to make it. Sure, the KKK would obviously choose Trump over Clinton, but according to the Snopes article, it wasn't a clear endorsement. Oh, that's good. <laughs> then it's okay. Um, and like Jim Mayhew is telling me to give it a rest. Now, it, see, this is the kind of stuff, it's like, I, I have a hard time, so this is my timeline, right? This is my timeline. I'm doing what I want to do. If you don't like that I'm doing what I'm doing, you should just not follow me. Like, what, what am I missing? This is like saying, you know, you know I, went to, I went to Best Buy and I bought a TV and I'm too cheap to get Comcast, so I just get over the air. And where I live over the air, the only channel I can get is QVC. So I turn on the TV and it's QVC, QVC, QVC. So I finally wrote into QVC and I said, stop running ads. <laughs> well, dumb shit, why don't you get cable so you get more channels? You don't have to watch QVC. So that's my attitude. Okay, so, um, so here is, here is uh, Clinton had no interest in securing the border, solve the illegal immigration issue, modernize our military. So let's just pretend that you know I really I'm offended, but I gotta find one where somebody really attacks me, you know. Um, oh, Shane, I used to think you were so smart, guy. Okay, this is a good one. <laughs> Turns out the Apple evangel evangelist was really just a salesperson for someone with poor decision making skills. Is he talking to Steve Jobs? <laughs> okay, she's a liar and has placed our national security at risk in ways, and I'm sure you really don't care about it. Benghazi didn't bother you. Never mind that you know 60 people died under the Bush administration in 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 embassies, but that's okay. Anyway, so then four of his little troll buddies g gave it a like. So then I said, oh, okay, so are you going to buy a Windows computer now that I'm the Apple evangelist and I'm tarnished? Okay, you know, knock yourself out. Um, but. <sighs> Wait, okay, I'm gonna just show you one last thing before, because I'm getting sick of this. Come on. You should just stand here, maybe. We could try another port, but my other port is the Ethernet connection, so I can't try another port. Now, if you guys had an HDMI cable, like we in the valley do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I'll show you how you hide somebody. So, uh, if I wanted to get rid of old Shane here, you just hide the comment, and now he still sees it. His buddy still sees it. Nobody else sees it. Life is good, right? <laughs> and then I gotta tell you, if people really, really personally attack me. I also ban them, and ban them means they cannot see what I post anymore. They cannot comment. But I tend not to ban people because I want their interaction because. You know, Facebook doesn't make a differentiation between positive comment and negative comment. Comment is a comment. Comment counts as engagement. Engagement is good. So that's that's my trick for you. Um, hide, don't delete or ban. That's troll the trolls, baby. It's, it's one of the most satisfying things in social media. Really, really, I kid you not. I kid you not. So uh, let me just check my list. Sure that I did everything I wanted to do. So I 
talked about Terry and Will, world's greatest broker. <laughs> I hammered on Doug. She works for Sereno, by the way, S-E-R-E-N-O. Um, Doug, I ripped with him about taking me to Carl's at high tide at the stairway. I showed you how I pose. I showed you refinery. I talked about it. I talked about the uh, trail. So I think I have covered everything I want to cover. And I have to tell you that I just love Saturday. <laughs> I would go surfing every day. I have, I'll show you how much I'm into surfing. So soon, oh, this, this could be embarrassing. Um, so this is my calendar. And then I found this great feed that shows the Santa Cruz tide for every day. So every day I check this tide and I say, okay, I want to be able to get out at 38th Street, so maybe I shouldn't go at high tide because I'll be dying. So I check tide every day and then if you go over here, like <coughs> I go to my fun and I go to surf and there's 38th Avenue and I'm a surf line. I should like make this my home page here because I just love surf lines. So this is 38th and I'm like watching this all day long. <laughs> the only site that I go more than this until November 9th is this site, which is kind of the worst <laughs> Okay, this site, 538. So, enough of my politics, enough of my ranting. Um, I, as I said, I, I truly have enjoyed Santa Cruz. Some of the highlights for me are, uh, I discovered a store called Dig. How many of you know about Dig? I, mean, I, mean, I spend 500 bucks every time I go into Dig. <laughs> so I love Dig. And what's the name of that vegetarian restaurant that's open till 3 a.m.? Saturn Cafe. Saturn Cafe. I love Saturn Cafe. And, uh, and East Side Eatery. And what's the place across the street from East Side Eatery? Cliff Cafe. Cliff Cafe. Cliff Cafe, 8 to 1 every day. Best bacon in the world. So, oh, and then across the street from them is, what's that ice cream place? Penny ice cream. Like I'm eating my way across Santa Cruz. <laughs> so, and by the way, by the way, um, you know, I, bu I bought this house in Pleasure Point. Uh, but I have a house that, I'll show you how much I love surfing. So uh, I have a house in Pajaro Dunes in Watsonville. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> you know, the Manresa and Sunset Beach breaks are shore breaks. And look, I just can't handle shore breaks. Of course, Doug never tells me this is different than a shore break and a rocky break, right? So I'm like, oh, go to Manresa, that's the closest one, right? I get killed that day. So anyway, so anyway, I have this house at Pajaro Dunes, which is for sale. <laughs> Five bedrooms, second row, you never have to worry about El Nino. It's never gonna go away, you know? You'll be safer than Jack O'Neill. you would be one house in. Uh, five bedrooms. Clear views. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on it now. I finished 13 books there. Someday it might be a national monument. <laughs> you know, we'll take cash offers tonight. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you.